Eric, while you're getting ready, can I answer your question about why the pharmaceutical industry doesn't work on things that kill people? Yeah. Okay. We don't know how. Okay. So the, we'd love to, but we don't understand the biology that allows us to do it. So that's why we desperately need to understand that better. I'll expand in a few minutes. <laughs> All right. So uh, hello from Houston. Um, uh, thank the organizers for the chance to come. Um, I'm going to begin with the punchline, just so we can put it into context. I, I viewed my tasks in looking at obstacles, and I, I divided it into three areas. Um, not in the beginning, but as I started to, to put things down on, on, uh, on a slide. The first were, were technical and material issues. And I'll be honest with you, I, I see there are many, many hurdles. So I don't mean to um, in, any, in any way um, minimize the impact of these. But frankly, I see that all of those hurdles we can get over, um, particularly with the, the kind of people we've got together in this room, except for maybe me. Um, but they're not walls. They're not going to stop us. It's just going to be a lot of work. And, and we're going to have to work through many issues. Um, moving from that, I see there's, there are still are conceptual issues. Um, they've, they've popped up a few times, and there are probably many. Um, one of them is I think we need to have a, a clearer articulation of the goal. Um, you know, is it to identify um, targets? And, and I, I think we need to be careful and make sure we stay with uh, one or two primary goals. I think too often we try to develop a resource, resource like this that's a, a one-size-fits-all and we end up um, maybe not achieving our primary goal because we tried to make everybody happy. And so I'd like to see us um, during the, the, the coming days and, and I'm sure months ahead, make sure we're very clear about the goal. The other, and Aravinda alluded to this, I'll say more about it later, is organizational issues. I think there are a lot of cultural and organizational issues that are really going to be the most difficult. And, um, they're probably uncomfortable to talk about, and, and so particularly this group, I think it's important we get them out on the table and, and we look forward. So what are the technical and, and material issues? Is there a, a, a pointer? No? That's okay. So what I've done is uh, the next couple slides, I've, I've listed just a few of them. The, the, in my opinion, there are more hurdles. They're, they're not game um, stoppers. Uh, first, are there the available samples? And I think the answer, the answer is yes. Thank you, Lisa. So what I've done here, and this is published in an editorial in Genetic Epidemiology, is I put together a large number of cohort studies. And this is age down here, beginning with basically birth and children, going all the way up to octogenarians and centenarians. And there are a lot of samples that are available. And, and these are a, a very well phenotyped samples. And so I, I think we, as we move forward, we need to, to look at um, ethnic diversity, cultural diversity, um, age. If you notice, in, in, not a lot of um, you know, teenagers in, 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 in the 20s. And so there are holes in this. There's a lot of kids, and there's a lot of older people um, where we tend to see you know, early onset disease and chronic disease. But I, I think when, once we better articulate the question, we probably ought to ask, what do we want this sample set to look like and make sure we fill holes? And I think this even gets better as we think about international collaborations. Um, the UK was brought up and also in China. Uh, the other is data sharing. You know, that um, we tend to think about these large population bases as not want not wanting to share data, and I think that's not the case. You know, we can complain a lot about dbGaP, um, but dbGaP, along with the GWAS era, I think has really set a, a, a set a, a wheel in motion, a culture of data sharing. And so, as as we move forward, there are words in in the documents that were circulated, like streamlining or creating a, a new venue, and I think that's fine. You know, do we need to streamline this? Absolutely. We have to streamline this, actually, to achieve our goals. But the, the key that I wanted to get across is the, um, the large population data sets or the large population studies, they've crossed the bridge about data sharing. I don't think that should be an issue. The other, and Gonzalo, I think, brought this up earlier, is the complexity of the data. And, and this slide, this happens to be the, um, the, the pipeline in the Genome Center at Baylor in Houston. And there are, there are similar pipelines at the Broad, and I know in Ann Arbor also. But I, th I think we have the structure, basically, to bring BAM files together and, and from, from a diverse uh, 
resources and basically homogenize and get them mapped to a central or, or a common um, map and then also to, to call variants in a common way and then distribute that data back to this um, it, whatever this is. It's going to be a commons or dbGaP. Uh, again, I think there are many people working on this very difficult problem. So again, I, this is not a, a uh, um, I think, a, a, a game stopper. The next issue, the next set of issues then are, are conceptual issues. Um, the first is I, I still think that we, we've, we're struggling as a field to think about the impact of rare variants in public health. Um, and, 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 you know, the, people are quite comfortable about rare variants in Mendelian disease. I think people still think that rare variants have these very large effect that I forgot who said it, that make a foot come out of the top of your head. But indeed, these rare variants have effects in the continuous distribution. So you can, you'll see enrichment of rare variants in the tails, that's clear. Um, you'll see clear Mendelian um, disease causing variants in the tails of the distribution but you'll also see them throughout the distribution for many reasons. One is variable penetrance. Um, second is the effect, you know, where did they start in terms of their background environment or, or their background genotype? So they're not always in the tail of the distribution. So I think many of us need to, I think, think harder about the role of rare variants in, in health and disease. The other is we need to recognize successes. I think in general, the last, I don't know, five years or so, we, I, I think we as a field have not done enough about marketing and trumpeting our successes. We've had very many successes, and this is one that's already been brought up. I think it was Francis, if I recall, brought up that um, work with Jonathan Cohen and Helen Hobbs and the Eric study, um, where we've identified basically loss of function mutations in PCSK9 that lower cholesterol. So these are people that have the variant or have a variant. This is the people who do not have the variant. And you, you see two things. One, you see it lowers LDL cholesterol. And going back to the previous um, conversation with David, is it also lowers um, events. So this is basically the percent with coronary artery disease or coronary heart disease. So it not only lowers risk factor levels, it lowers events. I think far more importantly, frankly, is the ability to follow these people and look for adverse effects. So where we, people that have these variants we bring them back into the clinic and we do a much better job in phenotyping and look for adverse events and adverse effects. And if you follow the literature, for example, recently on statins and age-related cognitive decline, so unfortunately statins um, increase the rate of age-related cognitive decline. I can also tell you PCSK9 carriers have advanced rates of age-related cognitive decline, just as an example. Uh, most importantly is organizational issues. Um, Francis isn't here, but I stole this out of a, a nature perspective. I think there are numerous silos that we're going to have to begin to dismantle to make this um, it a, a reality. Um, the silos exist at the NIH in terms of funding agencies and, and ICs within the NIH. They exist within each of our institutions. Believe it or not, they exist within very well-functioning consortia. So we're going to have to remove these, the silo effects. And I think one of the disadvantages we're going to have and challenges we're going to have, my experience is when money gets tight, those silos get higher and they get thicker walls. And so we're going to have to figure out creative ways to continuously erode those silos. The next point is we're going to, just a reminder, as I, restating that we're going to have to have clear goals and expectations. And I use GWAS as an, as, as an example. It's, it's almost become kind of cool the last couple of years to criticize GWAS. And I think part of that is because it, it's a moving target. What it, was it supposed to do? And, and because it didn't meet somebody's ideal, it didn't explain all of the heritability or it didn't create a drug tomorrow afternoon, there, there's a lot of press that, quote, GWAS didn't work. I, I read that over and over again, and I think that's total nonsense. That as a person who spent a lot of their life in, in complex disease genetics, I can tell you this sort of bubble karyotype that Terry's group has created, it was extremely sparsely populated before GWAS. And so as a result of G, GWAS, we have a number of loci, and in some case, a number of genes, of which we can actually examine very carefully for rare variants that are contributing to disease. 
So I think, again, it's, it's important for us to just articulate the, the goals and expectations and not deviate from them. I think the other, and I'm going to use something close to home for me just as an example, is that the, the consortia themselves are changing. And, and I actually think many of you are worried about the culture of data sharing probably more than, than you need to because the consortia realize we're probably going to need to share data um, more than we've had. So here's an example from the Charge Consortium. And then I won't go through the details of this because it's not important for this meeting. It's basically a lot of NHLBI large cohort studies that have done GWAS. They've contributed the data to a central resource where meta-analyses have done, and this has been very successful for an, a very large number of phenotypes. But we realize, as we have um, begin to analyze not just exome data, but whole genome sequence data, that that model is making our, our, our scientific endeavor fall short. And so we we're moving then from a meta-analysis model, really in creating a scientific commons, where, where the, the, the um, samples are sent to a centralized lab, in this case with uh, Richard at, at Baylor, and the sequence is, is created, and it goes into a scientific commons where it's QC'd. Uh, we've had to work through the, the data use agreements and also all the IRBs. Again, it was, they were hurdles, but they were not walls that we, we could not um, um, get over. The only comment that I'll make, because it hasn't really been talked about, is the analysis model. We've found as we've pushed this forward in, ca in the case of whole genome sequence that actually a combination of a central analysis model and a distributed analysis model um, works quite well. So for those institutions or collaborators that do not have the local infrastructure, we can provide centralized analyses and get them results um, according to a pre-specified plan. And for those um, institutions that either have a very specific um, analysis that they want to do that's very specialized, we can actually distribute the data back out to them. So this combination of centralized analyses and distributed analyses I think works quite well. The other is not to forget the important cultural um, truism of making sure we have good, young, uh, motivated investigators. Um, many times if the, if the project is too centralized, young people tend to think that it's an impenetrable barrier. So we need to make sure whatever we create that we invite to make sure we, we foster young investigators who are going to make the most use of these data and also uh, translate um, the, those into publications. And here's just an example from, from that. Here's whole genome sequence data. It happens to be CETP. I picked it just as an example with HDL cholesterol. And you can actually then use this kind of model. And this happens to be from a centralized analysis with Eric Framingham and CHS, the analysis using whole genome sequence data. So I think this is an exciting direction that we're all heading. And we have documented to ourselves that, that uh, some sort of a, of a um, commons is necessary. You cannot do these types of analyses using a meta-analysis approach. You need to be able to bring the data together. So just uh, in, in closing, um, I'm, I'm an optimist. And so I would leave us with two things. I'd say we've met the enemy and they're us. And I really think we need to work on these cultural issues uh, much more. If we're going to have the scientific commons or we're going to have a centralized data set, we're going to have to um, work together to, to lower those barriers. And then I think the other, and, and NHGR is very good at this, is, is setting very large goals and, and sticking to those goals and breaking those goals down into a series of small steps. So I think we've, we've got the right group here together to make um, progress, and I'll stop there and entertain questions and comments. Lisa, do you want me to leave this up? Here? Yeah, All right. Aravinda? I'm going to ask a question just more to the science in the future. I mean, uh, you are much more aware of the details, which is, what is the status of uh, cohorts, of getting cohorts and getting new people into cohorts or new kinds of cohorts today? I mean, much of what we real, meaning really benefited from are the cohorts that have existed, funded in the, right. quite, quite in the past. And, um, I'm not saying it obviates any other thing we ought to discuss, because there will be new samples collected nevertheless. But the cohorts have a very particular kind of place in this kind of new epidemiology, so. Right. Well, I mean, it's not a secret that cohort studies are expensive. 
and it's and also that money's tight. So, but on the other hand, I, I think the leadership has examined the existing portfolio of cohorts and asked where there are shortages. Um, and one of the probably the the obvious one that NHLBI and I think NIDDK and please um, correct me if I'm wrong in that have come together and form a large Hispanic study known as SOL, the study of Latinos. Because that, that's an example of a, a, an area where it was almost an embarrassment. You know, we have the, the, the fastest growing sector of our population. I live in a state where we're, we, we are a minority, you know, they are the majority in that particular case. And that, not only that is they have a disproportionate burden of disease, and so there are new cohorts being founded in that study of Latinos is one example. Um, I don't know if there's anybody here from the Children's Institute. There's the National Children's Study, which has limped, I would say. But I, you know, I I'll try to be positive that there's a, a lot of effort to, to um, kind of reinitiate or recharge that under a more simplified model. Um, so it spends less and, and, and collects um, collects more individuals. The, the only comment that I will make, though, before I stop is um, on this the recontact issue, I think, is an important one. You know, having, you know, worked in many, many cohort studies over the years, I would say, and collaborated with geneticists with those cohort studies, 99 times out of 100, it works extremely well. The one time out of 100 it doesn't is some cowboy tries to contact the participant themselves. And it's important to not to, first not to do that and to set up mechanisms so that doesn't happen. That doesn't mean you can't recontact them. We have permission to recontact them, but there's procedures, appropriate procedures to go through to recontact them. So I think we, we should, I, whoever said it, we probably should have a separate meeting about recontact, but that doesn't mean we can't recontact. We can. It's just we have to go through um, the appropriate steps to do it. Yeah, I'm, I'm interested in this discussion about cohorts because in Europe there's a real shift towards just using your healthcare system as your recruitment system, as your blood tracking system, as your phenotype, as your first line phenotyping. Um, and this obviously requires electronic healthcare records right. uh, and coordination across that. And although that's not universal, um, you know, there are, there are projects obviously, I mean, most obviously in Iceland, but also in Finland in Scotland and in Denmark, all set up in a very similar way. Mm -hmm. And this seems like the kind of, um, this seems like the end point. And so why not go to the end point? Mm, well, so if you think we're gonna come here and change healthcare in the US in a day, it's not no, gonna uh, happen. Sorry. <laughs> no, uh, sorry, let me get this straight. Uh, I guess using HMOs, what, Mayo Clinic or whatever, or the sure. Veterans Association. Why not use the Veterans? Uh, what, is it the well, veterans? there are a is lot that, of. Is that, is that the right? Uh, if you think we're going to have the Veterans Association in a day, so there no, are a lot. Sorry, there I, are a lot I, of issues okay. in in access to these types of, of data in the U.S. But let's be again. Let's be positive. The, the U.S. is moving towards um, a, a more um, an electronic medical record that has a, a semi-standard format. I think the difficulty in the U.S. that electronic <laughs> medical record tends to be for billing purposes, not really for diagnostics purposes. Um, I also think as this discussion moves forward, it's you know Eric probably can correct me representing NIH. My understanding this this it is not a U.S. yet. This will be a collaborative or national effort, and my hope is that we'll have studies from the U.S., including some of these cohorts and many others, studies from the U.K., studies from Iceland. Holland, China, et cetera. So I think we'll have a mixture of, of, of formats. Yeah, so Eric, I think your mixed model is extremely attractive because that it, instead of having a, a fight over should it be centralized or should it be distributed, identify which things make the most sense to study centralized and which things make the most sense to be distributed. Right. Certainly the phenotypes being distributed is extremely important because it's going to be very hard to get um, a rich phenotype centralized. On the other hand, DNA analysis is much more easy to do centralized. Right. So I, I think that, that this, despite the disparities in the healthcare system, to see the, um, uh, the cohort groups 
that have the richest phenotype data coming to this kind of solution it, is reason for optimism. Yeah, I would agree. I was, I was going to comment that, the, that for example, um, Kaiser of Northern California has uh, had a GWAS study done on 110,000, and there's another 100,000 or so waiting to be done. And so I think the idea of using medical records and HMOs is really an important piece of this uh, complex uh, right. future. Um, of course, the, the, the good aspect of it is that the phenotyping is already done and it's available in an electronic medical record. The bad side is that the phenotype's already been done and it's in, a, in an electronic medical record. So you don't get to ask the questions that are not being necessarily done as part of routine clinical care. Right. I'll make one comment, but then I'll turn it over to Debbie. We, uh, we have an enormous sector of this population that's uninsured. So to think that every American has access to Kaiser is just not the case. So I was just going to bring up to answer Ewan's question is that there is a, a, a large-scale project in the U.S. called Emerge that actually is looking at genetic association. So there is a mixed model already, and I think it's really important to consider this rich model as uh, Bob has brought up with Kaiser. There are many HMOs in the United States that are exploring these issues and doing GWAS and showing it can productively be used to find similar things that can be found in the cohorts. And I think that's true for every level of genetic data. It's just a matter of learning how to use it. And obviously, um, uh, other countries have been more facile at using it than we have, but mm -hmm. we are looking at it. The other thing HMOs may solve is this gap of age. If you looked at that first slide, the number of individuals studied between around seven years old and 20 years old is very, very small. So things that are occurring in young individuals, we're, we're missing if we were to rely on cohort studies. If I could just make one, one other comment about, um, about culture, um, and, and that is that David made the point that many people in the pharmaceutical industry don't know biology, but I think that many biologists don't know any computational genomics either. And in fact, um, th this reminds me very much of what the situation was like when molecular biology first started to move out of basic science labs and start to be applied. I mean, it, it, I, I remember distinctly a visiting specialist expert came to our lab when I was a postdoc to help us learn how to make packaging extracts for phage and how to make, how to make echo R1 from bacteria. And, and uh, I, th I think there, there's, there's an enormous uh, educational gap uh, in that uh, perhaps one of the things that can come out of this meeting is a very, very strong push to increase the size of that pipeline. I know there is a pipeline, but it's much, much too narrow. Well, I think one of the things everybody would agree, this is going to be an interdisciplinary effort. There's, you know, this isn't going to be solved by either computational biologists, by genomicists, by epidemic. It's going to, it's going to require an interdisciplinary effort. There was one question over here. Okay. Mike. 